Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The Islamic Republic of Iran is in an extremely bad shape, with setbacks in almost every issue set, health, economy, military ambitions, and foreign policy. Yet for Tehran, all is not lost, as it awaits a turn of events in the American political arena. For the time being, however, as it has not fulfilled its threat to avenge the death of Quds Force General Qasem Soleimani, it seems as if Iran is determined to wait out the contest between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, in the meantime using its Shiite Iraqi proxies to try to drive the US out of its Baghdad embassy. Iran has also been unhappy, but relatively quiet, regarding the normalization of relations between Israel and Arab countries. So where are the Iranians at this juncture? To analyze this topic, we're joined from central Israel by Mr. Meir Javed Anfal, who is an Iran lecturer at IDC Herzliya. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. Also joining us from another location in central Israel is Dr. Menachem El Khavi, who is a research fellow at the Truman Institute at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Welcome. Good afternoon, thank you very much. And joining me here in the studio is our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and I'd like to immediately dive into today's topic. What's new with Iran? Where is it heading to, especially now with so many uh, new strict regulations, new sanctions imposed by the uh, U.S. administration, uh, basically forcing the international community to comply whether they like it or not? Well, it does seem as if the um, Trump administration, uh, in this case led by Secretary of State Pompeo, is um, using uh, all of its ammunition because if one takes stock of the uh, last four years, uh, this is uh, the maximum pressure campaign coming to its end. In exactly four weeks' time, we are going to have uh, the elections. Of course, the next administration is also is uh, only inaugurated next January 20th. So in any event, we still have uh, another two and a half months of uh, the uh, Trump administration, no matter who wins uh, November the 3rd. But in any event, there is some feeling of a lull, whether it's before the storm, whether this will go on. It seems as if um, things are frozen in time. The uh, Iranians uh, are not trying to provoke any American military response, which could um, help uh, Trump. They say, of course, that they don't care about uh, the results of the elections. They don't want to interfere. But actually, they are interfering, but not by not doing anything. Um, they would like whoever wins, but preferably Biden, to uh, go back to the table. They say they are not going to renegotiate the joint comprehensive uh, plan of action because uh, this is a deal they agreed to. Um, whether they are going to expand on it uh, for another deal is left unsaid. There was a very interesting talk by Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif with the Council uh, on Foreign Relations uh, September the 21st, in which he said a couple of uh, very important things. First, he said that between the years 2010 and 2015, the Iranians had enough low enriched uranium for eight nuclear bombs, but they decided not to go down this route and um, try to solve the problem uh, by diplomacy, which they did. And the other uh, thing he said regarding Soleimani's death is that they did not close the books yet. They will take revenge, but not right now. Indeed. Uh, Mr. Javed Anfal, I'd like to ask you the next question. Uh, last week we heard uh, during a cabinet meeting Iranian President Hassan Rouhani coming out and, and uh, uh, speaking about uh, public rebuke of uh, the Ayatollah regime over its handling of the current crisis uh, uh, in Iran. Beyond that, of course, uh, the economic ramifications of its uh, foreign policy and uh, actions and uh, uh, stating wholeheartedly that it is the Americans that should be uh, addressed for those uh, difficulties, not the Iranian regime. Uh, and it is... Uh, 
the Iranian uh, uh, regime who has been uh, battling with resilience against uh, the American, uh, 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 the, he called it uh, uh, piracy and used different uh, uh, terminology for that, of course. But uh, at the same time, we also hear him say uh, or pledge to the Iranian people and to the regime of the Islamic Republic that uh, the day is soon coming for the Americans to kneel before the Iranian regime and its people. Are we seeing here a little bit of a conflicting uh, uh, statement with regard to its intent, or is there something here uh, beyond what we hear? Uh, you know, Jonathan, there's a joke in Iran at the moment. Uh, there are many jokes in Iran, but one of them is that uh, Iran is the only republic whose religious is Iran is the only Islamic republic whose religious leaders seem to be uh, awaiting the arrival of Joe Biden more eagerly than the arrival of the hidden imam. Um, yes, it seems very much so that they are uh, look that they are hoping that Joe Biden returns in order to fix the country's economy. And I think look up to a certain extent, of course, you know you cannot ignore the fact that. Uh, the sanctions have been responsible for Iran's ailments. That's undeniable. But I think Mr. Rouhani is repeating the same mistake here. Um, before the nuclear deal, he sold the upcoming nuclear deal as if it's something that's going to solve majority of Iran's economic problems. We will reach a deal with the Americans. They will remove the sanctions. You know, but he oversold it. And now he's doing the opposite. He's saying that everything is because of the Americans. So if tomorrow, let's just say Joe Biden wins and there's, there's a new agreement, uh, you know, most of Iran's economic problems are not going to be resolved. Many of them will, but there are some fundamental issues which are, uh, you know, uh, making uh, limiting the capability of the Iranian regime, um, especially its economy. I, I could go into those, but that will take a very long time. So um, look, uh, look, Rouhani, his hands are tied. His hands are tied from now till the day he leaves office. He's just trying to survive. He's trying to find somebody else to blame. I think many people in Iran found his claim. Uh, he said that you know, uh, you know, America should be cursed. He used the word cursed for 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 oral economic problems. They, to put everything on the shoulders of America. I think that's a lie. But you know, politicians are very good at deflecting blame. Um, but I think everybody knows that America is not responsible for uh, all of Iran's problems. And even, you know, former senior cons uh, conservative uh, deputy speaker of the parliament, Mr. Bahona, said America is responsible for 50 percent of our problems. 50 percent of other problems come from uh, within. And when they say 50 percent of com problems come from within, Iranian officials usually give a discount. I think probably in this case is higher than that. But look, Rohan is just doing what many politicians do. It's just he's just trying to deflect blame and survive until the day he leaves office. With that, Dr. Omer Khavi, uh, we see the Americans ratcheting up pressure on the Iranian regime, uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, within a month from today, uh, there are going to be held elections in the United States. Uh, still, there is time until the Trump administration uh, comes to, uh, to the end of its term and uh, may indeed also continue to a second term, which, uh, as uh, everybody agrees, will be the worst nightmare of the Iranians not necessarily only because uh, that Biden is more lenient, but because he's less predictable uh, than the Trump administration and all that pertains to Iran. How are they dealing with the current situation? And is it uh, currently also a certain shift in policy on the field? Or are we seeing more of the same with regard uh, to its uh, employment of proxies, the, the development of the ballistic missile uh, program, and its uh, nuclear enrichment uh, program with uh, uh, clear aspirations? Uh, whoever doesn't want to uh, procure or develop a nuclear bomb doesn't need to reach those levels in the first place. So, so where is the Iranian regime actually heading to? So I will I will answer it on two two levels. Uh, I'll begin with with the last thing you asked about uh, the nuclear program. Um, I I honestly don't believe they had this amount of uh, enriched uranium as they uh, as they claim now. Iran is uh, has been known in recent years to uh, boast and brag about uh, achievements it has not. Uh, seriously reached. Uh, but that's besides the point, uh, even if they had one, um, I, I do actually believe the uh, what they try to say 
by by you know claiming they have this kind of uh, this amount of enriched uranium, and that is to say we we don't really want to put a bomb together or something like that, which I honestly believe this it was not about putting a bomb together, uh, not to mention uh, throwing it at anybody. Uh, so it's really more of a you know national asset uh, and national uh, kind of uh, uh, also national pride project more than anything else. Indeed. But the broader picture, and here I, I would like to uh, slightly disagree with uh, uh, Mr. Javed Antar, and that is uh, I, uh, I, I see Rouhani as someone who's between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, he's representing the people to uh, the, this, the, the leader, the supreme leader. Uh, and on the other hand, he does exactly vice versa. You know, he represents the supreme leader to the people and he's trying to uh, hold, you know, both ends of this rope. And it's it's a very, very tight rope to walk on. So uh, I think on the one hand, he feels the pressure of the bad management. And um, and again, a little bit in, in disagreement with uh, with uh, Mr. Javed Anfar. In, in the past, uh, in the not so recent past, uh, Mr. Rouhani actually uh, did uh, I would say admit to the, the 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 wrong things that are you know that are run in the econ Iranian economy, and he did not just lay it on uh, all on the U.S. This is just a very recent uh, proclamations of his. But uh, if you go back like six months, one year, even two years uh, before, uh, he, he actually did say that uh, the JCPOA actually exposed some of the you know, illnesses of Iranian economy. And he more than implied that it's the deep intervention of, uh, you know, of the uh, establishment of the security establishment, you know, revolutionary guards, etc. Mm -hmm. Just to tap into one more recent um, interview just from yesterday with uh, a high ranking, actually the number two uh, uh, person in the in the IRGC, where he, he really defended the, uh, you know, the uh, exploits of the IRGC around the region. And he uh, uh, and he basically said, you know, we it gives us more money than we actually expend on it. It was a very you know odd way to defend uh, this uh, you know Iran's involvement in Syria, in Yemen, etc. And that shows you something about the the need uh, the high-ranking IRGC officers actually uh, feel to defend their policy, to defend the uh, the execution of the policy of the of the Rahbar, of the supreme leader. Indeed. Mr. Oren, I'd like to ask uh, also in continuation to what Dr. Mikhail just stated. Uh, last week at the Majlis, uh, the um, parliament in, in Tehran, we heard uh, the commander of the uh, of the RGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, uh, Major General Salami, speak about uh, the various uh, uh, exploits of uh, his organization trying to promote uh, a resilience among the Iranian nation. But he stated uh, wholeheartedly and, and with conviction, if I may add, that uh, we're not heading towards a war because the foreign adversaries are wary of uh, Iranian capabilities and the capabilities of the RGC have been bolstered. At the same time, of course, we hear, as Mr. Uh, Javed Anfar has uh, stated plenty of times here on the program, and also Dr. Merhavi, the RGC has basically uh, used uh, the crucial infrastructure of the Iranian economy in old order to bolster its, uh, its own uh, endeavors, and at the same time, when it's sanctioned, also the crucial infrastructure of, of Iran is sanctioned. So how can you actually separate between the humanitarian needs of Iran and its uh, uh, terrorist uh, exploits uh, throughout this region? Well, one cannot be sure that the IRGC or, or uh, the Supreme Leader uh, are really concerned about the plight of uh, the population, the, the um, 85 million or who knows, 90 million uh, uh, Iranians, uh, only half of whom are Persians, the others being Azeri and other minorities, and uh, the uh, uh, Tehran elite um, is not too concerned about uh, these uh, masses. And of course, the IRGC has its own uh, bureaucratic uh, stake in what is happening. But the Iranians uh, last month uh, marked the 40th anniversary of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, which uh, of course uh, was very, very expensive in human terms. 
And many Iranians now, um, they are two generations later, if they look ahead, are they going to spend uh, another generation uh, or two just defending the revolution, quote unquote? People have grown weary. People see what is happening around the world. Of course, the COVID-19 crisis uh, perhaps uh, stopped some of the progress around the world. But Iranian youth, just like anyone else around uh, the globe, they want um, to get ahead in life. They don't care about uh, the Islamic revolution or exporting it, but they are powerless uh, to do anything uh, about it. Now, ironically enough, uh, Zarif has been uh, uh, speaking uh, to the Americans in their own language. He, in fact, promises that he or the regime in Tehran is not intent on regime change in Washington. Of course, it's usually the other way around. Um, and uh, all he says is, uh, we will judge you according to your behavior. So there are plenty of fictitious accounts in Facebook, Twitter, and so on that have been banned because they have been uh, identified as Iranian possibly, trying to manipulate public uh, opinion in the United States with but, regard but to the, the election. Yes, he alluded to that by saying that President Trump himself is uh, throwing the election into doubt by saying that perhaps it will be rigged. What can we poor Iranians add to it when the Russians and the Chinese and everyone else is uh, trying uh, uh, to meddle? And of course, they know that it can backfire. And the worst uh, thing they can do is endorse Biden, which of course Trump uh, will uh, exploit immediately. So they are waiting on the sidelines, uh, as all of us uh, said, hoping that Biden will win, but not saying it outright. Mr. Javed Anfal, I'd like to ask you with regard to uh, the near future, how are you seeing uh, the Iranians maneuver out of the current situation? Also vis-a-vis -vis the European Union, we heard a couple of weeks ago, French President Emmanuel Macron uh, talking about uh, America's pressure campaign against Iran, saying that it doesn't work, but at the same time telling the Iranians, look, if you're not going to comply with uh, the 2015 nuclear deal, you're going to face a lot of trouble from our end as well. How are you seeing uh, the Iranians now being in, in between the Americans and Europeans, while at the same time we hear behind the scenes in Europe, uh, there is a lot more uh, acquiescence, uh, a, a quiet agreement, if you will, with the United States administration and all that pertains to Iran. I think with uh, you know with Brexit giving France a more distinguished role in European foreign policy and the French government having problems now, as we can hear publicly, uh, with Hezbollah's uh, problematic behavior in Lebanon. I think that will come at a cost to Iran. How much, we don't know, it's it's not clear. But I think in terms of European uh, EU point of view towards Iran, I think that will have an impact. But putting that aside, I think uh, a lot depends again on who is going to be the US, next US president and what's going to be the strategy forward. If Biden, I think I think Biden is the more dark horse in this race than, than Trump, we know what to expect from Trump. Um, you know, if Biden comes and wants to negotiate with the Iranians, if the Iranians are going to uh, come up with, um, you know, demands that the Europeans feel that they are unreasonable, then I think, yes, the Europeans are going to uh, distance themselves more uh, from, uh, from the Iranian position. For example, Iran has said that it will demand compensation uh, from the United States for Trump walking out of the Iran nuclear deal. Um, and recently, Mr. Rouhani himself said that, you know, the, the, the Trump actions have caused, the sanctions have caused Iran something like $170 billion. Uh, I'm surprised that Trump hasn't used that for his re-election campaign, but this is a huge, you know, uh, admission uh, made by an Iranian official. So, you know, if the Iranians want to uh, renegotiate if, if Biden's elected using such a tactic, then I think uh, they're going to be uh, more uh, more isolated, but we have to. I think we have to wait and see. Um, to be honest with you, the Europeans, their role is secondary in all this. Uh, the, the question is now, uh, what happens between Iran and America? It's not just the Europeans who are waiting; it's also the Chinese. Remember all the noise that was made about this Iran and China? They're just about to sign a 25-year deal agree agreement, 
Mr. Zarif went and made a deal out of this huge deal out of this on Twitter. The Chinese are also, they are waiting to see what happens between Iran and Washington. That's going to be the key issue. Dr. Melchavi, on a regional scale, to what degree are the, the Arab uh, uh, Gulf states looking at the current situation? Also, after the normalization between Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain, uh, of course, being on the same side vis a vis Iran uh, and uh, the concerns voiced in all uh, three capitals with regard to uh, its expansionist policies, uh, do you see uh, it taking now a, a greater role in, in regional uh, politics, trying to meddle more uh, proactively in, in uh, other theaters as well, or will it remain exclusively in, in failed states, uh, including Yemen, Iraq, and, and Syria, and, and now Lebanon also, uh, in a much more substantial way? Well, again, uh, I, I see it as, as two fronts. On the one hand, uh, there's definitely the ideology and the apparatus you know, to intervene in the region. Um, but on the interior level, on the domestic level, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the people who lead this kind of intervention are on the defensive. They do not have the aura of Qasem Soleimani, uh, and, and uh, it's just obvious that they are on the defensive, they're trying to uh, justify their actions. And honestly, as, as an observer, you see, I think it's, it's pretty easy to see that they are also on the on the retreat. Uh, you see, Iran's a role in Iraq is being uh, uh, challenged time and again by Iraqis. Hence, the recent attack, uh, which was right away uh, kind of taken back on uh, Ali Sistani on the Ayatollah, Iraqi Ayatollah. Uh, hence, the um, uh, I would say weak and and somewhat uh, deplorable, uh, you know, condemnation of uh, the UAE of the Arab states that uh, signed with Israel, UAE and Bahrain. Uh, and Iran is on the defensive here. It's, uh, I would, you know, in a, in a, on a metaphorical level, I would say Qasem Soleimani is probably rolling around in his grave, uh, seeing that his, uh, you know, the people he left behind don't really know the job as well as he did. Mr. Owen, I'd like to ask on uh, the Israel front, uh, uh, as we're nearing the end of the program. To what is, uh, degree is Israel concerned with regard to uh, the situation, not only in, in Washington, where it, it's not 100 percent certain about Biden's position, but it is quite uh, understanding of, of Trump's uh, uh, policy, even though it doesn't always agree uh, and is aligned with uh, the method it uses to reach the goal. But uh, uh, there is an understanding between two sides. We just had, of course, uh, uh, former senior officials of the American defense establishment here in Israel speaking about uh, the, the fact that also during the Biden administration, if it would come into that uh, uh, situation, Israel's uh, QME, qualitative military edge, and uh, security or national security interests will be a top priority for the United States, regardless of who is in the White House. Uh, does that alleviate Israeli concerns, or is it looking into different possibilities and, and uh, maybe even closer cooperation with regional actors? When you are talking about Israel, you are really referring to the Netanyahu policy line, which is uh, not identical uh, even with his uh, partners, with uh, Gantz and Ashkenazi, the defense and foreign Even ministry. though he still runs the country. He does not run the whole country uh, on that. Uh, there is a cabinet. Uh, they have um, an equal voice there. And he um, fully remembers that when they were in uniform, they blocked his own uh, ambition to uh, take action against Iran. Now, a lot of things have changed, but nevertheless, uh, the Netanyahu line, while of course uh, uh, still in power, is not necessarily the Israeli line uh, looking ahead towards the Biden administration. So what you're saying that the defense establishment in Netanyahu's position, uh, which is more aligned with the Mossad in this uh, instance, is not completely aligned about the mythology of, of acting against Iran? Again, you are personalizing it because it is not really Mossad, but the chief of Mossad right now, the current chief, Yossi Cohen, uh, who is very close to Netanyahu and whose term expires next summer. But uh, basically, yes, the defense establishment, the uh, Israeli defense forces, 
the security agencies were for the JCPOA. The defense relationship between the United States and Israel has been rock solid during the Obama administration, during the Trump administration, and will go on regardless of who wins four weeks from now, and they will probably coordinate again their policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Mr. Javed Anfar, the Iranian outlook towards Israel, there have been, of course, alleged bombardments and, and uh, well, there have been bombardments which have been attributed to Israel in Syria and, and elsewhere uh, that have targeted Iranian installations. Are they concerned about this? Are they looking uh, into escalating the situation or maybe even alleviating the situation? Where are we heading on that front? Shortly? I think the Iranians there are are um, continuing with the status quo. I don't think they're going to be... I think they're going to be more careful about egging Israel on and giving Israel uh, any excuse to uh, to attack its position even more. But I think Iran has now big, you know, other challenges that it's uh, it's facing. You know, the Jonathan, on the Saturday, 28th of September, the uh, the the son of the late Shah, son of the late Mohammad Reza Shah, uh, uh, Prince Reza, uh, at long last did what many have been asking him for many years to do. He's come out now and declared himself as the head of the coalition of opposition against the Iranian regime. Um, he's calling for, you know, the people of Iran, uh, you know, in small, in small, from small uh, neighborhoods to big cities to uh, to continue with their demonstrations. Uh, he called for the army to uh, to join the people. He told uh, he called on the IRGC not to uh, not to attack the people of Iran. The, the same for the Basij. Uh, and he also you know, called the opposition to unite. He says, OK, we're going to put our differences aside. We should put our differences aside and focus on creating a democratic future Indeed. for Iran. And with that, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Mr. Javed Anfar. Uh, Dr. Melchavi and Mr. Oren as well, and I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.